So my name is Pia Jakobsson. I am president of NSWP and the co-founder of Rose Lions, the Swedish sex worker organization. And I will try to give you a good overview what the Swedish model really is, because it's not exactly what the Swedish state is, is saying it is. So I will actually give you a bit of background also, so you actually know where this comes from, so you understand the bigger, bigger sort of picture of it. My colleague Karina is sitting there. She's going to be a little sidekick today. Yeah, I, I always have this in the beginning of every presentation because I think it's important to remember that those guys are not sex workers very often. The experts very often haven't even met a sex worker. So I'm frankly sick and tired of them. So I, they are just in every presentation I have. So in, in, the, mid, in the 70s in Sweden, uh, in the midst of the sexual liberation kind of situation, they started to look at... Uh, we, particularly women, we don't talk about male and trans people in Sweden, women in sex work as victims and they wanted an investigation what was really going on. So this young academic went around and interviewed sex workers, some of them are still alive today, and she was fairly good at what she was doing. The scary thing is that the state had decided that the material was going to be reviewed by a psychoanalysis that had never met the women she read the interviews and concluded that they all have suppressed memories of child abuse, sexual child abuse, and that became a truth in Sweden. She never met them. So the first report actually talked about the tragedy of these women's childhoods, written by a person who never met them. Uh, then they, need, they need, did another overview in 93. And the recommendations is the one you see. They wanted to develop a national center for combating prostitution. Uh, they wanted to criminalize both the buyer and seller. And they wanted to make an extension of the pimping law to make sure we, we, you know, there were no porn films and no striptease either. Uh, they didn't succeed because there was a lot of criticism against this suggestion. So then, in the end of the 90s came the suggestion that it you know, ended up being the law we have. So there was no center to monitor what was going on. There was also, th there should be a lot of money for social services, that didn't happen. The only thing that happened was that they criminalized clients and placed it on top of all the already existing abolitionist laws. I think it's important to remember that there were no laws taken away to protect us or that we were decriminalized, like they say. We were not, selling sex was not criminalized in Sweden before, not the act itself, right? So they just had a lot of abolitionist laws and I will go through them quickly and then place this on top of it. So the law, you know, the law itself, this is what it says. The person for payment obtains a casual sex sexual relationship is penalized unless the action entails punishment in accordance with the penal code. Uh, they had some problems with the law from the beginning because they had a problem with what is a sexual service and they had to make up their mind that it was one person touching the other person's genitals. Touching boobs, yes. Peeing in someone's face, yes. <laughs> genitals, no. And then they were, had a problem with this temporary thing because a lot of us have regulars that we see for years. You know, we last marriages. I had, I had a client, he was married twice during our professional relationship. Then they decided that when a sex worker has sex with someone, every single time is, is just, you know, is counted as, you know, the first sort of. And no, sorry, it's fine. And then they also, you know, payment. So they, you know, obviously money but they also wanted drugs in there, and then they had to squeeze alcohol in there as well, because alcohol is a drug in Sweden. And then they got a bit confused. They were like, and expensive gifts like furs. And there's a lot of sex workers here. You know, how many have received furs as payment? Right? I think they watch too many, you know, bad American movies. Anyway, so they sorted that out. And the, the purpose of the law was, you know, as a tool for equality. Buying sex was considered men's violence against women. Uh, male sex workers were totally invisibilized. Um, it, the focus was on women, and it was f the focus was on women working in the street. You can take the next one. What happened really, really fast, it was already happening from the 70s and 80s, but it was a big shift uh, when the law was passed that if we didn't have a lot of speaking rights before the law, the law actually took it completely away from us. Because the idea behind the law is that uh, we are so damaged 
that we don't understand how damaged we are. So if we say we're not damaged, we say we actually are fine with this, it's further proof of how damaged we are because we are suffering from a false consciousness and can't even understand the damage. Uh, so, you know, and uh, so that and a lot of other silencing techniques just, you know, came really, really fast. People, someone like me, I obviously wasn't representative, therefore you don't have to listen to me. Someone like my colleague Karina, she's so damaged, she doesn't have a clue. No, apparently it takes us five years out of sex work before we understand how damaged we are. I'm two and a half years now, so I'm waiting for, so we'll be ready for the change. Uh, so, and then they started, they did a, some um, sort of research by the, the Board of Health and Welfare. And in, in the last one, they were called Knowledge on Prostitution, in the last one it was actually quite ambitious academic, because in the first one they didn't interview one sex worker, in the second one, 2003, they upped the ant and interviewed one sex worker. So that was 100% more. But actually, the third one that came, they wanted to talk with sex workers. And so she went to the, the prostitution unit in Stockholm. We have one unit in each big city. So these are, if you heard about the exit programs that Sweden say they have, this is, this is it. So, she, you know, it's, it's uh, therapy and a cup of tea. That's the exit programs. There is nothing else. Um, and asked them, can I can you put me in touch with informants? Because she really wanted to talk with sex workers. And they said, no, that's not necessary. We have a mandate to speak for them. And they sure as hell didn't get my fucking mandate, but anyway. And they also added that, you know, it would probably be so traumatic for sex workers anyway to be interviewed without asking sex workers. You can take the next one. And from the beginning, they, it was, you know, it, it, they talked a lot about drugs, our fucked up childhoods, the sexual abuse. And now, just they have broadened, the, you know, they started to broaden it and talked about, fin you know, financial forces, some economic forces. I'm like, yeah, I think most people work because they have to, right? Uh, maybe some rich people here that don't have to? You, why do you work? To pay the rent? To do like, we're all working out of some financial reason. Uh, during this time, they started selling the Swedish model. They went around, especially in Europe, it was called the, the Swedish Roadshow. Everybody called it the Swedish Roadshow. So the politicians went around for my fucking tax money, by the way. And I traveled afterwards. They stayed in a hotel. I slept on lumpy sofa beds. And I flew cheap planes. They flew good planes. But no one was really interesting, I interested in the law. But then 2005, they moved the law from this law that is about women's peace, uh, where the rape law is. And yeah, m men don't get raped either in Sweden. I saw you look. Trans people don't exist. Anyway, so they moved the law and put it in the criminal law and said, and repacked it and said, look, this is a tool to combat trafficking. Same law. They changed nothing. They just moved it. And suddenly countries were paying attention. And Norway took the law, among others. Uh, among others, no, really not among others, because Iceland just banned everything. So if they say Iceland had the Swedish model, it's not true. They have banned making, a making money out of someone else's nudity. So they banned topless bars, they banned everything. They also say Finland have taken the law. Not true. They have criminalized the purchase of sex of trafficking victims if you know they are trafficking victims. That's a different thing. But that's already sexual exploitation, so, you know. Next one. They will also tell you they have evaluated the law. Uh, I guess, well, they have a report to prove it. It's been highly criticized in Sweden. It's been very criticized in Sweden. Um, they did an English summary of it. They, did it. they left out the good parts. I translated them for you. So it says, the people still abused in prostitution. Okay, this is a translation. It's not my words. Let me put that out. The people still abused in prostitution says that the criminalization has increased, the social stigma that comes with selling sex. They describe that they choose to, uh, to, to prostitute themselves, sorry uh, about the spelling, and does not experience being unwillingly subjected to anything. Even though it's not illegal to sell sex, they experience being chased by the police, they experience being treated as minor as their actions are tolerated but not respected. And then further down on the same page it says, when it comes to the people still abused in prostitution, must the above mentioned negative effects of the prohibition that they describe rather be seen as positive, fr seen from the perspective that the purpose of the law is to combat prostitution? So they know. They know this law stigmatizes us. 
actually is the one thing we have consensus around in Sweden. We say it, the, the, the um, evaluation say it, the police say it. It's you know, so a beautiful interview with a police officer. She said, yeah, I know it's hard, harder to sell sex now with this law, but it's not supposed to be easy. So basically what they are saying is, so now your life is shit, so now you will have to quit. Which is not very charming from any point of view. The discrimination ombudsman in Sweden that never gave a shit about sex work actually did a very strong statement saying that this is totally unacceptable and said, said that they want to emphasize the, the increased social stigma in practice could mean fewer opportunities for health promotion and HIV prevention work, a perspective that is lacking in the investigation. And they went on and on and they criticized them very harshly. This document was buried. Okay. Me, I mean, the fi five people that I know that know most about the Swedish model, I would be one of them. We, I stumbled upon this like a year ago. We never saw it at the time. It was basically buried. Um, so with this evaluation, Sweden went on another tour, but actually now they take, they bring delegations to Sweden. And, and sometimes, sometimes I feel like there's a whole generation of brainwashed politicians, especially in Europe. Uh, because they don't ask for any evidence, they don't ask for numbers, they are just in their head, they are like, I'm going to be elected again if I do this. They don't care, there's no proof this works. There's, the numbers of street work went down just when the law was passed, but the internet boomed as well. So, And actually now the numbers are back to where they were before the law, which is kind of surprising because we have snow seven months a year in Sweden. And. When it comes to indoor sex work, there's actually no proof at all that it has gone down, rather the other way around. But as they never cared, they are throwing around numbers and we write them down because one week we are 1,000 in Stockholm and 500 trafficking victims. The next week we are 1,500 and 90% of trafficking victims. They ca just can't their numbers straight. Karina did a little count on the amount of sex workers and the amount of clients and she came up with the number that each sex worker in Stockholm would have to see 330 clients a month for the numbers to, to fit. So they don't know what they are doing, actually. Okay, so what happens in reality? That was the, you know, the history of the law. So we have the sex purchase law, but I've done that. But that's just one law and it affects us in some ways, especially when it comes to stigma, but not as much in daily life. Um, but what I will say is that the, with, the, with the law criminalizing clients, they hit the clients of street workers first. Now they have moved on and are targeting indoor workers. In Sweden, you don't need a court order to, to kick someone's door in. You actually just have to suspect a crime is happening. So we have sex workers having their door kicked in. Uh, you can take the next one. Yeah, just get them all out. It's fine. Yeah. But so what happens when the police comes and kick your door in, though, is interesting. Because we have three laws controlling, you know, how sex workers are allowed to live and work. One is the rental law, which means that the landlord has the right to evict you if you sell sex in the apartment. And then we have the pimping laws that says the landlord has to evict you if you sell sex in your apartment because otherwise he's a pimp. And then we have the landlord that says you have lost your right to own your apartment if you sell sex in an apartment that you have bought. There are also, um, uh, for, for sex workers that are between 18 and 20, there are several laws that affect them because there are several laws the Swedish police and social services can use to take care of people for their own protection, which means, you know, locking them up in some kind of home or, yeah. Um, we are also using the Alias Act to prevent migrant sex workers, even migrant sex workers that have the right to travel to Sweden and work in Sweden because sex work is not considered work. So they will, we will get reports from people being stopped at the border simply for carrying too many condoms, whatever that is. Uh, we have been having cases in both Sweden and also in Norway where sex workers are deported when they come, come to complain about a crime. So in Norway a few months ago, three sex workers living in an apartment or in a hotel room, two guys came in and stabbed two of them and robbed them. And they called the police, they went to the hospital, and then they were locked up, their passports taken away, and then they were deported, and one didn't even overstay. Uh, traditionally, we also, they've also been using the Public Order Act. Uh, it's not enforced that this, 
that much nowadays because they have so many tools to fight us. Uh, but they also use the tax laws because we, we call the tax office and we say, I want to register a company because you have to pay taxes on all income in Sweden. And then they say, no, you are not allowed to register. And then they will hit you hard if you buy something. Uh, so they don't even know what they're doing there. But the problem then is if you manage to register a company and you go on sick leave, you have to write sick leave if you pay taxes. But then they say, no, we are... The money you're supposed to get is this, the expected income, and as your clients are criminalized, you're not supposed to have any. So we, pay, we have a force to pay taxes, but we get actually nothing, absolutely nothing for it. I think this one. And just a little bit on HIV prevention also, because that was the worry of the discrimination ombudsman. So in, in the beginning, it must have been two, two, uh, like 10 years ago, 11 years ago, uh, a colleague of mine that I knew since she was really young was found in an apartment in Gothenburg three days after she died with undi undiagnosed, uh, well, it was pneumonia, but a result of, of being HIV positive. She wasn't, she didn't, no one knew. And when a 27 year old girl dies alone in an apartment as a result of living with HIV in a high income country, something is really, really, really wrong. But the thing is, the second we go and test ourselves, and the result is positive, we are out of a job. Because we also have, we also have this like, you know, non-disclosure, so we have to tell everybody, otherwise we are committing a criminal offense. Well, they will land you in jail. And people is top five country in sending people to jail for HIV-related crimes in the world. We do a lot of good things in Sweden. We also sterilized trans people up until two years ago. Just, Stockholm's first needle exchange to open a year ago, just so you get the, you know, how fucked up this is. And the attitude is basically this. This is a nice quote from my friend Jay Levy's research. It's our national coordinator against trafficking and prostitution. And this is how he feels about HIV prevention. Uh, they are even more uh, worried about the concept of any kind of s how, you, how you're supposed to work safety, safety, you know. So any safety guidelines will be viewed as pr you know, promoting or keeping people in prostitution. Uh, and also, they, they have an idea that that would actually lure young women into selling sex because they would think it's safe. So the three prostitution units, again, that we have in Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmö, the only one handing out condoms, and I want to say this is the only state funding, uh, regular state funding going to any, anything that has to do with sex work. So only one of them, the one in Malmö, is handing out condoms. The other two don't, even though they are receiving HIV money. But we were lucky enough uh, three years ago to, uh, in partnership with HIV Sweden, to get a project funding uh, to do peer-to-peer -peer HIV prevention. And we, man, we really used that funding for everything we could. So it was supposed to be this little simple exercise, but we ended up doing a big report. We had 124 indoor workers answering a terribly long survey, I'm afraid to say. And it turned out, I need to get my bag because I have some numbers there. 30% um, of sex workers, is, the sex workers that answer the survey get questioned on why they want an HIV test. And 68% have never received a condom in their hand as part of HIV prevention, ever. And 57% don't feel they can tell uh, that they are sex workers when they go and get tested. Hence, they won't get the test that they are needed, and they can't ask the question that they need to ask. And we also asked them, ask them tons of questions. We asked them, what worries you? Top answer was, I worry about prejudice from authorities. I would say that's not very successful if the authorities are supposed to save you, and then, you know, yeah. This doesn't look like so much. We asked them, have you ever been, been discriminated? And 30% and said more than once, but actually in a country where if we don't want to get kicked out of our apartments, lose our kids or anything else, or be really attacked by the social services, one third of sex workers being discriminated against more than once is a lot because we don't tell anyone. And again, back to the lovely prostitution units of our informants, 82% had never been to one which means they never ever been to service provider for sex workers, any kind of service provider. Zero percent were sat very satisfied with the services provided. 
There was also a state report on the work of the prostitution unit in 2011. The Stockholm prostitution unit, staffed by eight full-time, had 42 clients in a year. I don't think that's maximizing my, my tax dollar, you know. 82% uh, of our respondents says they think the law creates more stigma. 82% said, yes, I totally agree. The law creates more stigma. And I want to leave a, a bit of room for questions. So I just want to talk a little bit about Jasmine. We, we showed the movie. Um, the, the sad thing is that Jasmine is not the only one that lost her kids. There was another girl seven years back. And when the social services took her kids solely because she was a sex worker, she knew this was a dead end alley and she committed suicide straight away, actually. Uh, when Jasmine died, it was for, for us personally, I mean, she was a board member of Rose Lions. Uh, she was like my extra daughter. She had a key to my apartment. She, you know. And it's, it's kind of weird standing here in the next day's conference looking at a picture with her from last day's conference. And she was so excited and she said, even if we don't have funding next time, I pay for myself because I want to go to Australia. And I'm here and Karina's here and she's not. Um, and Jasmine's, well, the whole thing around Jasmine has not been resolved. In Sweden, when something happens like that in, within the social service system, the, 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 the social services have, a, uh, they have an obligation to report themselves to start a formal investigation. More than one year has passed. It still hasn't happened. The, the mother of her ex-partner that murdered her gets to see the kids. Her mother never met the kids because she didn't have a chance. As she, you know, she didn't get to see them herself. So the authority says that she doesn't have any connection with them. So her mother is not allowed to see them. I just want to point out that you know, how you know, however sad it is with Jasmine, and it's the most well-known sort of situation from Sweden. But it's one of many. You know, it's one of many. We have. Uh, one of our board members lives in lives in, a, in one of the big cities in Sweden, and her ex-girlfriend was charming enough to make sure the whole of her city knew that she was a sex worker, which resulted in her being evicted. Not only that, she had not very charming. Uh, the whole LGBTI sort of group in that city throwing stones at her, literally throwing stones at her. And she has n no friends left. And, you know, we bring her up to Stockholm so she can hang out with us. But it's, you know, so Karina always says when she does her presentations that, you know, sex workers in Sweden are the loneliest people I know. And it's really true because we can't afford to have friends. We can't afford, I mean, I have two close friends in Sweden. I have many friends abroad. But we, can't, we, we live in isolation because it's the only way we can protect ourselves. Just wanted to end this with a happy picture. So this is from the Pride Parade in Stockholm. People do get very upset with us being in the Pride Parade as well. They're like, you're romanticizing prostitution. We're like, we're miserable like 353 days a year. Can we, one day, can we dance one day? Let us be happy one day. Um, it's been a challenge starting the organization in Sweden. I'm surprised at how far we come because we have pushed and pushed, and now we are actually at every table. Uh, some of them very much thanks to the partnership with HIV Sweden, because they were actually the first one that were brave enough to engage with us. Um, on the other hand, that project is running out. So in December, both me and Karina are unemployed and not very likely to get another job in Sweden. So I guess it's back to sex work, which is fine. OK, I'm going to stop there. I, could talk, I can talk about this forever. I'm not going to do that. I rather, if someone has questions, that we have a little bit of time for that. Hi, my name is Kimo from the European AIDS Treatment Group. First of all, thank you for a great presentation. It's uh, coming from the neighboring country, Finland, it's always shocking to see how bad the best countries in the world can actually be. 
when it comes to stigma and discrimination and, and criminalizing uh, everything almost. Uh, anyway, going uh, to health promotion and HIV prevention, uh, what do you see are the uh, key issues at the moment when it comes to HIV prevention uh, among sex workers and how could example our organization be part of that and, and help to, to uh, solve the uh, problems? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, for, we, we always say sex worker actually, you know, we, we're best if we do our own prevention ourselves because it's actually more effective. Uh, never more true than in Sweden because there's actually absolutely no trust for anyone. We ask sex workers, how do you want to receive information about safety and, and, and uh, safe sex? And uh, number one was from a web page, number two was a sex worker organization, number three was from colleagues. Uh, the prostitution unions didn't rate very well in that. So it's really a matter of what, what needs to happen now. The only way we can get a functioning, uh, any kind of functioning uh, HIV response in Sweden is really if uh, we get funding. I'm sorry, you know, I, I would gladly do it in partnership with others, but it's really, you know, it's really, there's no trust at all. People don't trust anything that is state-based. And also, there is a, a problem with uh, when we are going to test our, ourselves. We need to lie and say uh, that we have like slept with a man from Africa or something to get our HIV test. So uh, there is so many problems to uh, solve. Yeah. Hi. Um. I'm a sex worker and an injecting drug user, so like... Okay, yeah. Um, what I'm interested in is how drug criminalisation and harm reduction criminalisation um, intersects with backdoor criminalisation of sex work in Sweden. Oh God, I can talk about this forever as well. Uh, first of all, harm reduction is shit in Sweden, you know. Um, it's, the attitude is very much the same, so if you give a condom to a sex worker, you're encouraging prostitution. If you give a clean, you know, syringe to someone using drugs, you're encouraging drug use. Bullshit. Anyway, uh, especially in OST treatment, it's been really, really, some really, really bad shit has happened because we have sex workers who use drugs in order to get methadone. They have to sign a contract and promise to stop selling sex, which is completely bizarre. And, and just in general in Sweden, when it comes to any kind of, uh, any kind of OST, it's, it's, you know, so if you have a, give a, a blood, blood, blood sample one time, you're kicked out for six months before you let in again. And, and the same is true if you break the contract of not selling sex. So if you sell sex, you're also kicked out of your treatment for six months. Um, yeah, so it's, the, you know, having the double stigma is not very useful. No, right. So when Karina went into her treatment, because we are both sex workers who use drugs, by the way, maybe I should have said that. Anyway, yeah, it's just so many hats on. Uh, she went into treatment, and at the time she was working in a strip club, apart from doing some other sex work, and they said everything would be fine if she stopped eeling around a pole. Eeling, you know, like the eels? Yeah. So that was the solution. She would immediately stop with drugs and alcohol. I was curious um, about, you said that there were a couple of funded uh, sex worker organisations or organisations that were funded to do HIV prevention for sex workers, but only one of them was giving out condoms. What, what does the other do? So that's the, it's the three prostitution units. It's what will be... What the Swedish state will tell is the exit programs, right? So they are they're from the local council, but it's state money. And they're at the Stockholm unit, which is the biggest one, they, they say that their job is to get people out of sex work. Uh, I have no, we have started to raise this question now in Sweden, and actually the people that are distributing the, the HIV money, because we pushed, they are now forcing them to start to hand out condoms. And they're going to cry every time they have to hand out one. So I'm really, I'm going to go and film it fucking. But that's what they do. They do therapy, uh, and apparently th they describe the therapy very well in their little manual. So the therapy is, first of all, that you talk about lack of boundaries, childhood abuse. It's a very set agenda. 
and then you go there once a week same time same day every week and every semester it's evaluated so this is a long-term thing you know um, yeah but that's what they do that's all they do the one in Stockholm is attached to a health clinic uh, that is from the from the health services uh, the other two doesn't even have health clinics Yes, actually, there's one in Queensland in Australia that is the same. It's funded by out of the Communicable Diseases Unit for HIV prevention. Uh, the only thing that it does is exit and prevent, you know, exit training, uh, transition, career transition work. Yeah, and I think I think you know everything I told you. You have to put it in a big context. So Sweden has this. Okay. I'm not going to do the whole story, but let me put it this way. The first, first center for race biology in the world was Sweden. We sterilized people from the 30s into the 70s, many of them for being promiscuous or from having some mental health issues. We have a really long, shameful history of social engineering. And this, when you look at sex workers and drug users and trans people, it's so clear, you know, I mean, it's, you know, we have different kind of rights and then we will, you know, we're lacking some rights and it's not the same for all, all the three groups, but we, it's really clear we are unwanted. You know, they don't want us there. So it's like, either become like us or you can die. That's really the feeling you get, especially if you belong, like both me and Karina, both, uh, you, both are sex workers and drug users. It's like, you're really not wanted in society. You're really supposed just to just either become like them like the, the, their idea of perfect, the perfect person, or you, they don't care. Because as soon as you, do, you say, you know, I, this is not working for me, I, this, is not, this is not what I need, I need this instead, they are like, you're, they're treating you like you're a five-year-old that's not appreciating a present. You're like, you should be grateful. This is a rich country, it's for free. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to be forced to do anything. Uh, <laughs> So Karina is, uh, since, since they stopped the, you have to eel, eeling around the pole, they realized she had, has ADHD and she's on Ritalin. And she has to go and give blood samples every month, it, seven years for Ritalin, seven years. Yeah. And they're threatening all the time to take it away. The, you know, the one thing she really needs to be able to go to a conference like this, for example, because it's, you know, you know we all need fucking Ritalin for this. Yeah, right, no, <laughs> don't I know it? We often hear about the Swedish laws referred to as the Nordic model here. Have you talked about that already? I missed the very beginning, but... Yeah, no, I think, th again, the Nordic model is something we should not use. It's actually Sweden and Norway that has the law. law Norway took the law because there were a lot of complaints about a lot of black horse in the street, in all honesty. So it was a really a migration tool. There, I in Norway, it, it is a different situation because there is much more awareness of the harms because the, so the, the service providers, most of them, especially the main one in Oslo, has been on board with us all the time and been fighting this law as hard as we have. Uh, and I'm sad to say that the police in Norway, they didn't have to, in Sweden they had to sort of learn how to deal with this law. But in Norway they came fully trained by the Swedish police, so they really escalated into human rights abuses much faster. So in Norway they managed to uh, do a blacklist of sex workers for hotels. So now sex workers who have ever been caught in a hotel will never be able to rent a hotel room in, in Norway again. And this, the Norwegian police also had an operation called Operation Homeless, which sort of sounds like a good thing, right? But it was about raising awareness so people would say if sex workers were living in apartments and working there, so they would be kicked out. So it was about making people homeless, which is a little bit different, I think. Do you have any allies in Sweden that are working with you around this? Uh, as I said, we, we have been having a partnership now with HIV Sweden. Uh, we have a long-term relationship uh, with, with the LGBT movement and, with the, and specifically with the Swedish Drug Users Union. So when we started completely without any kind of money and we were just a small group of people, uh, the Swedish Drug Users Union in Stockholm gave us a key to their office and said, use it, have your meetings there. Uh, and 
you know, so, so which was lucky. So we, we have a long history together. So we do have allies, uh, not that many, and not any that can give us any money. But anyway. All right, if it's no more questions, I'm going to say thank you. And if you have any, you know, want my contact details or Karina's contact details or ask anything, you know, outside the microphone, just come over. Okay, thank you.